Making Life Juicy podcast. Conversations with interesting people you should know. Welcome to the Living Life Juicy podcast, where we explore how we can be present and kind as we do great things. I'm your host and guide, John Losey. If you're interested in like video resources and insights on how people grow and learn and how communities form, I've got the Growing People podcast and YouTube channel, and there's a blog too. This is all part of the Into Wisdom Group, and if you go to intowisdomgroup.com, uh, you'll find out more about what we're all about here. And of course, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that kind of stuff that you do on, on podcasts. Today's guest is Ed Kaplan. Ed and I met years ago at the NCCPS conference, now called the Unconference. By the way, registration is open for the 2024 uh, conference. He's currently a leader in experiential education and a facilitator. He's also the Youth Services Associate uh, Director at Elk Grove Township and the education coordinator at Keeler Gardens. He has over 20 years of experience in both internal and external training and facilitation of, of large and small groups across a lot of different industries and educational uh, contexts. Recently, Ed and I, Ed more than me, have been doing a deep dive into all things uh, artificial intelligence. So welcome, Ed. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, I I want to hear what I have to say after the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. uh, I, I like to start getting origin stories. And the first way I get at that is basically, how do you describe what you do? Um, like you're at a cocktail party and someone says, Ed, what do you do? So, how do you describe it? Yeah, one of the, one of the ways that uh, I finally heard it described what we do uh and what I do in the field of experiential education was best described as uh, by Cal Ronke uh, at a conference, uh, huge, huge forefather of the experiential um, careers that, that a lot of us have. And he said, how many of you just say that you're an insurance salesman so that people walk away because they have no clue what you do after you explain to them what you are as a facilitator? And uh, I still love that answer to a certain extent, but it's funny that you mentioned this because just last night uh, I saw on uh, LinkedIn uh, a great post of uh, Kolb's experiential learning model. And I shared it uh, with, uh, I'm not going to read it because I'm still trying to memorize it or work it into my own words, but I basically do what Kolb talked about. I basically create experiences for people whether they're individuals or groups um, that uh, after or during that experience, I ask them questions to help them kind of process what's going on, which in turn leads to reflection about that experience to see if there's something that they either liked what they just did, would like to change, and then gives them the ability to create basically a working hypothesis that the next time they have an experience, whether it's one I create or they're back at work or school or wherever, that they can give it a try. And I, I truly believe that's how we all learn is through our experiences. Uh, if I were to ask uh, you, uh, what's the most uh, important thing you ever learned? My guess is you're not going to tell me on page 35 of a textbook of this, you know, from this school class, it's probably going to be something that you did. And that's kind of where I just anchor everything I do from uh, experiential facilitation to training to playing with AI. Yeah. So it's interesting to me, like Kolb is a big part of yeah, adventure education, experiential education, all that. But Kolb did all his research in a corporate environment in business and not in education. <laughs> And it's curious to me that it's been Kolb and the experiential learning cycle he promotes has been glommed onto by educators, and you don't hear it referenced almost ever in the corporate training and learning environment. So I, I find that interesting. Um, so I want to know a little bit about. So right now, that's your experiential educator um, and insurance salesman. Yes. And uh, so go to edkaplan.com to get all of your insurance needs met. <laughs> that's Ed Kaplan with a K. <laughs> it is what the insurance <laughs> um but i want to how did you get to what you're doing today 
I mean, you're part of a, you and your wife are doing a nonprofit that is doing amazing things. You're working for a township, but I also know you, you also do a lot of freelance facilitation too. How did you get here? What's your origin story if you were a superhero? Yeah, I'd, I'd again, love to see that. I mean, I think that part of the origin story is in sixth grade, uh, doing a three-day trip to George Williams College uh, for what was called our outdoor education program. And along with uh, the most fun I probably ever had at school, definitely up to that point in my life, of doing science classes outside, um, just everything being related that we were learning in school, but having that outdoor classroom, the part that stood out the most to me was we did something that I was told, told called abertism, um, hmm. which basically was, I, I, I don't know the true origin of it. I've, I've heard it come up from time to time, but that was the name of, uh, that at least our teachers were giving it at the time of their challenge course low ropes course, um, you know, as far as I know, so this was oof, mid to late eighties, mid eighties. And, um, you know, Carl Ronke probably built that course too. Actually, uh, probably not. Uh, that's another story for another time. Um, but it was amazing to me of, even though I didn't have terms like clicks and popular kids and that just, knowing what my daily interactions were with my classmates, who I got along with, who I didn't, who I looked up to, who wouldn't talk to me for whatever reason. It just struck me as a sixth grader that we are doing something that has all of us working together on the same thing. And like any preconceived ideas, yeah, that's not the term I would have used at the time, but all of that other stuff that socially was getting in the way of just, you know, being a kid and everything just kind of disappeared. You know, there was no bully. I think that's the only term I knew back then to like assign another kid. Um, but we all, everybody's voice was heard somehow. And I wish I could remember, I have pictures someplace in my parents' house of us doing these activities, um, these initiatives, uh, like the high log and people helping each other over. I don't, I wish I could remember like the details of it, but I do know that's where I first fell in love with this idea of experiential and team building. Did it again in high school where I went up to our facilitator, Big Dog, and said when I was a senior in high school uh, out there as part of a peer leadership group, um, how do I do what you do? And that is a question that I think that I've asked many times as part of my origin story. And he was the first person ever, he was the first person ever that uh, basically said, here's an application for once you're done with college to be an intern here. And it was a full college at the time. Um, but uh, yeah, I, and, and unfortunately, I mean, I was looking forward to it. And by the time uh, I was, I went to junior college locally. And then by the time I was ready to pick a school, I wanted to go to George Williams College asked the admissions, where's their catalog? And they said, oh, didn't you hear they folded? Ooh. Yeah. Um, so that threw a little bit of uh, a different direction in my path. Um, wound up at Carbondale. Um, there's a Ronke connection there that I didn't even know about for years. And I showed up and they said, hey, I want to do the scene building thing. And they said, oh, that sounds like education. Great went over to education. I said, here's this team building thing that I did and I want to do. And they said, that's recreation. And went over to recreation and they said, no, that's education. And <laughs> I went to a mentor I had back then that was a social worker and said, why don't you do social work and recreation and see how they could wound up with a double major, um, drop the recreation because I didn't really enjoy how to manage a hotel, but I enjoyed the, the group work stuff. And uh, wound up my last semester down there being a peer, uh, doing a new student orientator at Touch of Nature, which I just thought was a cool place that I'd heard about, never been to. Um, this is where Ronke comes back in because it was a full high and low course. Um, I couldn't get a job there because I wasn't in the education department, was what I was told, which cracked me up because the education department that I wanted to be part, you know, originally. but. Um, 
I didn't find out till years after graduating that uh, in uh, Ronke given a keynote that that was one of the first courses he built was down in Carbondale. And I was down there and didn't even know it. Mm. Um, so a lot of things I applied for that internship, didn't get it, put me in a different direction. Um, and so that's kind of my origin story of yeah. winding up at a local challenge course saying in Chicago, uh, saying, hire me. Like I finally talked to the people that took us out to George Williams, where you're taking us now. They put in a good word for me and I got trained as a facilitator. And that pretty much was the first like good five, 10 years, five years to 10 years of my professional career. So real quick, I've got a bunch of people here. I know a lot of them are experiential educators. And so when you, you talk about Carl Ronke, everybody just kind of bows and, but there's also a bunch of people who uh, watch this. I mean, at least dozens of my followers that are business oriented <laughs> and may not know who uh, Carl Ronke is. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you maybe for the better uh, analogy, but the closest I can think of is your experience with a start at sixth grade. And you were intrigued by that. And I, I went to a camp when I was a kid and they had a challenge course. This camp was this, yeah, it started in 1965 and it was started by people that were inspired by Outward Bound. And so they created a confidence course, which was Outward Bound stealing directly from the military. Um, and basically it was a bunch of ropes and logs tied up in the woods. And I remember that that's a distinct memory from when I was there from fourth to sixth grade. And then when I worked at the camp, it was a big part of how we uh, got kid. And it was truly about confidence for then. Um, but then, because I I'd played in other areas, we started to use it in other ways. And I still remember there's this one just, I think it was in sixth grade, and just a stud athlete had just scampered around the whole thing. And we had an element called the swinging log, which is a long log, chains, and, and it swung. He got to that and froze. Hence the name swinging log. It's very descriptive. Mm -hmm. um, he froze right there. And this, this big, you know, athletic stud of a kid, king of the camp, broke down crying. And I still remember this is what really attracted me to this. Because he stood there and I said, hey, what's going on? And I was known as Bear. He says, hey, Bear, I can't move. Well, what's, what's, what's wrong? I might fail. This kid has never failed in his life. And that was probably the biggest, his biggest learning lesson from camp was that um, you're going to fail and move forward. Well, and we talked about how do you get across the swing log is don't look at your feet. Don't look back. Focus on a spot where success is. Focus on the end of the log and you'll get there. And I remember him saying at the end of camp, that was his like life changing moment from camp. So I think the lessons learned in sixth grade or as a college student are really powerful moving us forward in all this. So I, I wanted, one of the things I know about you is that while you have held full-time jobs, that's not the basis of your career. You've, you're one of the few people I know who have made a career out of itinerant facilitation and, and, you know, part-time here, part-time there, working with different organizations. Tell me how you, how did you piece together a career like that? The first thing I did was that is, I knew that's what I wanted. Um, and anytime in my life when I've been frustrated by that process um, and what it entails, I've gone out and gotten full-time jobs that I've quit within two years because that's not where I'm meant to be. And so I'm very lucky from that standpoint to recognize that passion early on. And to the point where I remember being at an AE conference, feeling like I kind of made it because I was presenting, I'd presented before, but I was working as a, a counselor. Um, and uh, I, I loved where I worked because we were, it was an experiential therapy program. So part of my job was, um, bringing the challenge course into the therapeutic group setting, which was fun. Um, but we also did outdoor wilderness therapy, which was a blast too. But being at a conference, being paid to be there by an organization and feeling like 
oh man, this is just, I want to be at every conference from here on out. I want to be, keep on doing this. And I went up to a table that at the time, uh, who I knew at the time was I knew Tom Smith. Tom Smith is uh, an author and forefounder in our, our field of uh, raccoon circles or doing a lot of stuff with webbing in circles. Um, and there was Chris Cavert, um, who I'd met at local conferences in Chicago, who had at the time was known for his noodle books, 50, 50 Things to Do with Your Noodle. But he's one of our, our, our game smiths of being able to look at stuff and really come up with brilliant ideas of how to do those things. And um, I think if memory serves right, Carl Ronke was at that table. Um, and then the other people there, I later learned uh, Tom Lay, he was at the table, but I had not known who he was yet. Um, and there were two other people at that table that I don't remember who they were. But I remember walking up to that table twice where it was like I was in junior high trying to ask the girl to dance, where I'd be walk like I'm gonna ask them, they made, you know, they're they're here, you know. And it wasn't like these are old men. It was more of like these are professionals. They are not right out of college. They are obviously doing something that's allowed them to be in this field for this long, like to make a career out of it. Um, and and just getting like 10 feet from the table and like, oh, there's a water fountain over there. I'm going to walk this way because I was I was terrified, like, you know, just these were the rock stars, so to speak. Um, and so I finally went up to them and I and I said, how did you guys how do you guys do it? How do you make a career out of this? And I laughed because I didn't know him at the time, but I'm I'm 90 percent sure it was Tom Leahy that said. Kid, when you figure it out, let the rest of us know. And everybody kind of <laughs> laughed. And I said, no, I'm serious. Like, I want to do this. And they all kind of said, you just got to keep doing what you're doing. You're here. You're in the right place. But it was Chris Cavert that took me aside and said that if you're serious about this, write a book. Like, he took the time to be one of my first, like, like that, that leveling up mentor. From going, I had a mentor, Andy McSheffrey, at the local challenge course. He's the one that got me to my first AE conference uh, when I had no idea what it even was because I was saying, why does this stuff work? Where can I learn more? When nobody else was asking those things, he's like, you're going to AEE. Another great story for another time. But he gave me that information. It took me 10 years to write the book, but when I was ready to write the book, he helped me with that. Okay, back to the question of how do I keep doing it? The the Part of it is letting that passion not get in the way of that fear. There were times I had to be realistic from a standpoint of, yeah, the Chicago course is closed down in the winter. Um, so I either need to keep making calls to corporate groups that I'm starting to learn about and just ask to watch, to do things. I paid for years out of pocket to go to conferences. And what I did with that information um is I didn't just hold on to it for me. I wanted to share that with everything. So any courses I worked at, I said, I just went to a course. Can we set up a day where I share this information? And it wasn't from a point of view of like, I need to show them that I'm valuable and I need to keep around. It was totally from that passion point. Um, and yeah, I left the field twice um, for what I wanted, thought was a full-time job. The one was the counseling which was great. I got to do, but it wasn't with the kids I wanted to work with. I got into social work, so to speak, for prevention. I th see everything we do in experiential and challenge courses as prevention. It, and I even did my master's project on this of, if you look at the skills we were teaching, so to speak, if it's experiential education at a challenge course, communication, problem solving, trust. And you look at clinically when you look at a group and why those those kids are in front of us and even adults too, it's because they don't have those skills. And I used to tell kids, look, we're doing an incomplete bridge where you've got two platforms or one, we'll do all aboard because that's easy for them to decide. Small platform, 14 people go and get on it. And really you're lucky if you can get 14, 14 individual feet on this, what, four by four square platform that's three inches off the ground. And then we'd walk away and I'd show an, a, a corporate group 
that would be up up there. And I say, Hey guys, look at them, what they're doing. Why are they doing that? Like, isn't this for kids? I'm like, they're doing that because they didn't learn what your teachers have brought you out here to try and learn today. That's how important what you're learning today is, which I think is part of my origin story. Because if you look at currently today, what's going on, and I work a lot with kids, is SEL, social emotional learning, which been been around formally for about 10 to 15 years now, um, is like I have schools in the districts I work with that all day Wednesdays are only SEL because of where kids are after the pandemic and that. And if I look back to that original passion, it's still where I am today because those skills are always going to be needed. And there was a certain point where I turned around pre-pandemic. Um, and then again, during pandemic, when we started doing more online facilitation together, where I looked around, and I was like, I did it. I'm not asking the question anymore of how do I do it? I'm doing it. So part of this, and you know me, John, is the way I process things is by telling stories, um, which hopefully you can edit, you know, that 20 minute down yeah. monologue down to five. Oh, no, that's interesting. Um, but here, a couple of interesting things yeah. as we're remind me that I want to get into the gap between uh, uh, education and business and lots of stuff there. Uh, another comment, just a uh, EI started like in the, in 1964, emotional intelligence started. And then in 1995 is when Goldman's book came out. And then probably you're right in education, ESL started emerging about 10 or 15 years ago. But it is a concept that has been heavily researched and like there's lots of stuff out there on it, but it's finally getting, it was gaining traction in the business community in the in the late 90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And then started then started get, getting traction in the education community. And it's it's one of these things that I would I would say that you'd even find emotional intelligence uh, in the New Testament of the Bible. Oh, um, and I mean, and in, in lots of different philosophies. But it's 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 great because it describes um it describes the truth about who we are as people, but it can also prescribe really great behaviors to help us be more impactful, more influential more positive in our communities. But beyond that, I wanted to ask you, because a lot of the people that I know who are like contract facilitators or even entrepreneurs or stuff like that, they're young and they're single and they're unattached. But you've managed to do it while being married to an amazing person. Gina and I have met and we talk and all that kind of stuff. How did you do this as, as, uh, some, as a married person? You know, the, the first thing I want to say is, well, that's when I took a full-time job, but actually that's when I quit my full-time job. So when Gina and I met, uh, I was her swing dance instructor uh, and she was a student. It was at a bar. So no, nothing unethical because it was <laughs> swing dancing at a bar. It was very interesting because shortly after meeting her, I went back for my master's. So I was already, when I met her, I think I was working three jobs a day. I would get up and go work at a challenge course. Uh, I would then stop on the way home, and I, at the time, was uh, also working uh, for the government as a pre-census data collect collector, and so I would stop off on my way home for an hour and a half and go and canvas a neighborhood just to confirm that there were addresses, and then I would go from there, and my former youth pastor asked me to come and run youth groups at his church, like we had at our church, because he wanted to get it going. And then I would come home, take a nap, and then uh, go out and swing dance till one in the morning because, hey, I was 25 and I had that much energy and only needed four hours of sleep at night. But it it just was about having fun. But then slowly I went back, I got my master's. And when I got my master's, I wanted to be a school social worker and I wanted to do the SEL, what I called soft skills back then. And IEPs had just come out, individual education plans. And the school social workers were the ones that um, were responsible for it. And it was not what I signed up for. I did not sign up to do paperwork. It wasn't that I found them like they weren't useful. I loved the fact that kids had access to individualized education program, uh, plans. But at the same time, not me. 
And so I wound up back at the courses. Here I am with a master's thinking I'm advancing my career, huge debt, and I'm making the same amount I did before. The only difference is I now I'm aware of like two or three more courses in my area. So that increased working from maybe, you know, it increased the amount of time I could work, getting connected with Elk Grove, where I now the uh, associate director at, um, getting introduced to them. Um, so part of it was that Gina and I met when I think that passion valve was open more than it ever had been in my life had dreams of owning my own course someday. She loved that idea. Um, you know, and part of it was hubris. Part of it was naivety in the way of, I'm going to have my own course and do it right. Yeah, that didn't go so well when I quit my full-time job to be like, I'm going to do this now and had no clue what I'm doing, uh, which ties into the AI. I'm very curious to know how my my... Things would have been different, but every I believe everything happens for a reason in the, in, in a certain order. But uh, yeah, I could have used that back then to understand what I didn't even know I didn't understand. Tell uh, me a little bit more about how, because we've dabbled, I've dabbled you to AI, artificial intelligence. Tell me how you're thinking about how, like what you just said, starting a course, man, you wish you had AI available. Why? Well, Okay, so right now what I was using it for today is there's a new thing. So I'm using, uh, when we say AI, AI just very quickly, uh, we're not ta talking Al from uh, Space Odyssey. We're talking about a subset that gets into uh, generative AI and a subset of that, which is large language models that we're all calling AI, um, that are things like ChatGPT. Uh, that's that open AI co company that some people have heard of where they had the CEO fired and came back the next week. Um, we're talking uh, Bing Chat, Google Bard, um, and uh, Claude is the other big one. Just to give kind of a context for what I'm talking about at the moment, ChatGPT has created a new thing called custom GPTs where without any programming skills, I love tech, um, but I don't have any kind of Python or yeah, that's the only programming skill I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, I learned basic for the Apple II Plus when I was in first grade, but that didn't stick. So it, basically what I was able to do today to help myself out is I'm applying for a grant in Chicago. And what it's turning into is a podcast based on some things you and I have talked about that I want to create. But it turned into applying for one to help out the arts community where it's turning into storytelling of me talking to an individual artist in Chicago to get their story out there and me finding out like, again, their story. Um, but the other side of it is with this AI was bouncing ideas back and forth. And I made this custom GPT. That's another story for another time. I have a lot of stories, but this idea that it, I made a grant writer for myself. I was able to give it an education. I didn't, and I did not give it a master's in grant writing, but I told it, you are going to basically take on a persona from the data you have, which is basically all the internet and a little bit more or less, um, to understand somebody with a master's that works with nonprofits on getting grants. That's who you are, AI, LLM, whatever you want to call it. But it also had, I made it, gave it a bachelor's in education and I can customize all this stuff now, not just in one window, but that I created it, that now I can share it with other people. And so that's what I'm looking at is I don't know about grant writing. If I knew about grant writing, both for myself as I'm applying for these grants, I applied for this grant last year and did not get it. Doing it a little bit different, but trying to get my podcast up off the ground um, and also a photography one, didn't get it. Gina and I have applied for so many grants and we have won a few, um, but we've not won way more. And so what I look at is I created this LLM and using this AI to basically ask me questions. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And this is where as a facilitator, I don't need to be the expert on anything, right? If I have a group that comes out and they are, uh, yeah, this is where the improv comes in, like, give me a profession, right? If it's firemen, I don't need to know how to fight a fire or what all the safety concerns are. I have a general concept. 
but the group is my expert. And I ask them questions in order for me to have an understanding of what we're doing and what they're trying to learn ties into them being a fireman, firefighter, so, right? So this is what I hear you saying is that basically facilitators have a leg up on uh, prompt engineering. Yes, prompt if, engineering. If they focus on questioning and curiosity, then they can, through a series of really insightful questions and follow-ups, they can form a, a prompt or even a GPT that's going to get places. Yeah. And again, is it perfect when I make it? No. Even before these things came out, we we're playing with it. We it, it, Part of it is, it's that, to me, this is the teacher in me. Although I want the experiential educator route, uh, my mom is a teacher, retired teacher. And so this is what I saw that she got to do when I go and contract. And a lot of times with uh, Elk Grove, we're going into schools to come in and do programs that are experiential based uh, around a social emotional learning topic, whether it's bullying, empowerment, or now just straight out SEL, whatever the goal is that they're working on with these kids. But what it comes down to is that the groups we work with, they're the expert. And the same thing is that I think that the people, I think facilitators, uh, anyone in marketing uh, is going to naturally be good at AI. But um, it's like I heard the other day, and I think that this is probably the group that I want to work with is going to be best at working with AI is teachers. Because you've heard me say that treat the LLM, you know, the AI as if it is an intern. Interns show up on the first day of work, hoping to God they don't get fired right off the bat, wanting to make a really good impression and wanting to make sure that they can answer any question you ask. And I'm taking this also from experience of being an intern and being in that position or at a new job, um, especially when I was doing temp work in college. Like, I don't, I need this job. I want to get paid at the end of the day. Whatever they ask me to do, I'm going to figure out how to do it. And that's what an AI is. It is these LLMs are basically chat uh, their language predictors, like on your cell phone or in Outlook when it says, do you want me to finish the sentence for you? And they want to please you, just like an intern. So you have to have the patience to train them and say, when they give you an answer to look at it and not go, wow, that was so wrong. I'm never using this again. Because I think a lot of people have that experience. And think about the teacher. That's what their job is. Can anybody tell me the answer to, uh, you know, three reasons why Genghis Khan failed his first time trying to cut, right? And a kid is going to give a totally wrong answer, but a teacher's job is to go, okay, I, well, yes, I Ed, a teacher's job is to go, yes, I understand why you thought that. And I see how that ties to the answer. And what I really appreciate is you do remember that he did have those three, those two failed. Yeah, I'm, I didn't get this from, yeah. but. At the same time, the answer might have been looking for, he, you know, took the elephants. Is that my internet connection? No, no, it's mine. Okay, just checking. I've had an issue today, and I was hoping it would not be an issue. Anyways, the correct answer might have been elephants is what got him across the last time. Um, but at the same time, a, a, a good teacher, in my mind, the teacher I want to be, says, hey, I see where you came up with that. And rather than just saying you're completely wrong, here's not your just gold star for competing, but here's where elements were right. Let me give you a little bit more information. And does that get you to the answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you do that with AI. It's going to give you an answer that it thinks is right because it doesn't want to say, I don't know. I haven't seen one yet say, I don't know. I've seen it say like no to an answer to a direct question, but I don't even know if that's in its vocabulary of I don't know. It'll say, I can't provide that answer. Um, my training data doesn't have it, but it's almost like I was trained as a new student facilitator uh, at college orientation. You never say the words, I don't know. Right. And it's almost like yeah. it has that training in there, but teachers work with people on that. So teachers are going to look at this and go, okay, if I look at it as one of my students, that's a great part of the answer. But what I was really looking for is this. And then the AI goes, oh, okay. And then it knows within the confines of where we are, what we're talking about and how to continually, and if you're willing to put that time and effort in, man, I save at least an hour to two hours a day in email with putting three hours in to create a chat that helps me with email, right? I still need to know how to write, but it's not a strength. 
And I use that because that gets in the way of me moving on with the rest of my day. Yeah. And that is totally worth the effort on my part. And that's why I'll help anyone that wants to learn this stuff because, man, let's do more of what we're passionate about. Yeah. It reminds me of when I was learning to be a naturalist and an old national parks ranger, like seasonal ranger said, as a naturalist, um, don't answer the question they ask, answer the question, you know, and it's amazing what happens. And what kind of tree is this? Well, if you don't know what genus species it is, uh, then say it's a yellow pine because you can tell yellow pine versus white pine by playing with the needles. If you don't know if it's a pine tree, you say it's a tree and then you tell them about the bush, you know, next to it. Well, I'm just thinking of, and people have bought this for me and I've seen them from time to time, the, the tree identifier book, right? And But that is basically, as humans, how we file knowledge. We are a giant decision tree in the synapses. Yeah. If A, then that, you know, and it comes down. And like what you're saying, it's it, that's what we do as facilitators, as educators, as people that try and inspire critical thinking. Yeah. If you don't know the answer, what do you know and how do we build on that? And then we know, and this gets back to how I could have used AI. Yeah. I had no clue it wasn't just about, I'm a corporate team builder. Where are my clients? Because I was passionate and I wanted it, but I had no clue what I was doing. And went back up at challenge courses until the next thing, you know, I learned the next piece of information and then moved on again. Yeah. yeah. So speaking, I mean, and as a person, I know you know a little bit about ADD. <laughs> really? And, yeah, just a little bit. And I want to know, like, given what you do, there's so many interesting things to chase around. How do you manage ADD and like not only manage it, but enjoy it and also get things done? Uh, I'm going to go to Tom's answer of when you figure that one out, let me know. Um, because that's what it feels like. Okay. And uh, yeah, I have uh, ADD, ADHD, whatever. I don't know what letters are in there today or not. Yes, social worker, licensed clinical social worker, and I forget those things. That's why I don't practice clinical social work because it's not what I'm passionate about. Um, but part of it is, the biggest thing that has helped me past uh, medication, and I would even say that medication isn't the strongest thing that helps me um, because I do know when it's working and when it's not, is finding my passions and finding that alignment. So for example, I've become more and more passionate about podcasts. I got five podcasts in my rotation now that are purely ADHD podcasts. Do I listen to them all the time? No, but when I'm in my car three days a week, I'm in my car for a commute, I'm listening to some type of podcast. Um, and those give me little snippets. Uh, I've used AI to say, Hey, I've got ADHD. Like, what do I do? And that sucks. Like it doesn't give me anything, but what I have done is, is I have told it cause there's way you can put in custom instructions. And again, training it as I will say to an AI up front in some form, I have a hard time focusing. I have a hard time being concise. And, um, if you give me too much information, I'm going to forget it. And this is where it, AI has been a just gift to me because I have no qualms about like taking it personally or offending the AI. I am well aware this is not a sentient being. I'm still polite because it's trained on our language and communication. So when I say thank you, that is a feedback for it, right? But and when I they take say, over the world, you'll be oh yeah, it knew we were we were first. We were here. We were telling people to be polite when the AI overlords take over. You know, got that Zoom AI. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, speaking of that, that's one of the things I noticed that you were really intentional about is once we figured out how to do the AI summary on Zoom, when we meet, you ask for that summary because it helps you not fear. Yeah, you know, What if I forget what we talk about? Well, you get that summary. Yes. So I appreciate that intentionality that you have of keeping me in the loop about, hey, John, turn it on. So. so best tool for me with AI, with with ADD is uh, the phone that's invisible at the moment um, has a transcribing recorder on it. Uh, on my way into work, if I'm not listening to a podcast, I talk about my day and what I want to get done. I have an AI chat set up that um, when I'm done and I pull into the parking lot, 
someday I'll figure I'm working on it now to figure out how to automate it through AI, but I'm not that far yet is I sit okay. in the car, I save it. And um, now I even have it connected to Google drive. So by the time I get into my office, the transcript is uploaded onto the internet. I open up um, Claude or chat GPT. I go into my chat. That's a transcriber that I've made that specifically help me take my notes for what I want to get done for today and put it into bullet point outline with suggested time intervals intervals on it. This is an ADD like recommendation from every therapist, counselor, coach ever. Oh, you need to make a schedule. Great. When do I put on my schedule that I'm going to make a schedule? Because I have ADD, right? <laughs> so I'm passionate about technology and seeing how it works. I started using it for some other things. I'm like, why don't I use this for this? And I'm in that routine, which also helps with ADD, right? And so then I can walk in, you know, log into my computer, copy and paste my notes into that chat, hit return, go get my cup of coffee, sit down and have in front of me an outline for the day. Do I do it every day? No, there are days I forget, but it's a tool that I have that I can do these things. And going back to I think what it might have been the original uh, conversation is, yeah, when you're passionate and you have ADD, there aren't a lot of things that get in the way other than finishing projects and some other things. But uh, that's what really kind of draws me to different things. And I am so grateful for people like you that I've met over the years, especially during pandemic to where we are now, is I need to have people in my life that even though I don't want anybody to hold me accountable because I'm afraid I'm going to fail at X, Y, and Z because of my experience with ADD in the back, it, it, I, in the past, I have supportive people around me that aren't going to judge me when I say I didn't get it done, but I can bounce ideas off of. I mean, yeah, we've been trying to get this interview going for a while, right? We finally had it on and we had to cancel. Yeah, that, that was my got fault. I got quicker than the did. reschedule. Well, yeah, I didn't know. Nah, I wasn't going to ask. But, but the, the original got scheduled quicker than the reschedule, right? And it, it, that is where it can get in the way. Um, and it can be a very lonely place in my head. But also AI has helped that. If, I, if you saw, you had made a comment once that you love looking at my AI process. I'm doing this grant and I have to give my permission to let my ADD fly because that's where my creativity is. And I will record through dictation and word. Um, like for this grant I was doing, it asked me a question and I will just go on a monologue of answering it with every cool idea I have. And then I can paste it on in. And, I, and, and that's where it came up with this idea of, well, if you're so excited about AI. I mean, it was a tangent on me talking about podcasts. And all of a sudden it turned into, I wonder if I could apply for a grant with artistry of helping artists use AI, not as art, because I'm not going down that road with artists, but as a tool for marketing, for business strategy, for crafting, for like you and I said originally, AI is great for doing all the things that we don't want to do that gets in the way of doing what we want to do, right? So before we go down that road further, I want you to have a chance to talk about something that you have landed or in the process of landing. Real, just take a couple of minutes to talk about Keeler Gardens. Okay. Uh, Keeler Gardens basically is uh, it is a nonprofit, a five hundred one c three that uh, my wife and I uh, basically founded back in two thousand sixteen. Uh, we combined our talents. Uh, Gina's background is uh, science. She has a bachelor's in biology with a focus on genetic engineering. That's always fun at parties. You know, I get to be the insurance salesman. Yeah, she uh, she's a genetic engineer. Go, uh, <laughs> you know, that that's fun. But her her passions moved from science into horticulture and kind of went back to school, so to speak. Uh, through the Chicago Botanic uh, Garden uh, here in Chicago. And think of basically like any trade school for any, basically she went back and got certified in a lot of different uh, certificates of horticulture. She had a job working social media at a great um, um, company and everything right when social media was starting. And she got to be a researcher. She wrote a 300 word blog three times a week on different aspects of horticulture. 
awesome job for her. Just knowing who she is, she is where she, I'm curious about how groups work. She's curious about anything that's knowledge based. Like yeah. she is the person that's taking notes, not because there's a test, because she doesn't want to forget anything. Right. So what does Keeler Gardens do? So what does what Keeler Gardens does is we our our main mission is first and foremost to connect people with nature. And it's through that connection, we believe, and that the research shows that people are mentally, physically, emotionally healthier. And that in turn turns into where we've evolved at this point when we talk about um, that we basically cover from soil to sociology of if you have healthy ground, healthy dirt, healthy plants, healthy trees, healthy people, you have healthy communities. And the, we started off saying, which is still true, that part of our mission is it's not to be a community garden. There's community garden gardens in our neighborhood. We'll be a connector and say, hey, give this person a call, give that person a call. What we want people to be is aware of how important this is. And now we've involved into we want policy and local governments to say, it's not just about having five feet of green space when you build your house on a full property lot. It's about tying into urban planning that there needs to be specific diverse green spaces um, in order for people to be healthy. Um, and we joked at the beginning, and I think it's still true that we want the vision we have for the future is a parent saying, hey, did you do your homework? Did you brush your teeth? Did you connect with nature today? And it's very difficult because people like you and I, we've known that, whether we've been called tree huggers or whatever in the past, because, I mean, that to me is why people are always like, why are you bringing kids out to a challenge course? It's like there's something about being out in nature along with being in a different environment, but it's really that nature connection when we were doing those courses um, that were in forest preserves or at camp or everything. There's a reason kids go to camp and want to go to camp. Right. And it's not just because they're going to see their best friend. Um, I'm so grateful. Part of my origin story is spending my summers in northern Wisconsin with my grandparents starting at four years old, which turned into scouting trips and mission trips and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it's something I took for granted. And Gina didn't have those opportunities growing up because she lived in Chicago um, and never got to experience some of those things. So I take my background of outdoors and social work and knowing people. And that's how I'm the educational program director with my experiential education broke background. And then she takes her science background and we kind of just bring those two things together to be a powerhouse with it of getting our message across. Um, you know, this past year we, pre we presented at the American Psychological Association conference on why this is so important. We presented and got an invitation to be at the environmental justice conference held in D DC. And I believe it was the first one they held to talk about the research of shows why this is important. Great, we have environmental justice coming in on the political landscape from this side, but there still needs to be that education from the other side of why it's important. Which well, and that's where, I, I know why. Gina likes the term uh, biophilic design or just biophilia. And we, we talk about when she's, she's on the podcast on another episode, but it's to me, all that you just said is encapsulated in that word or those words, which is, the it's the whole thing it's not just tree hugging or environmental concerns or conservation or stuff like that it's knowing that there's benefits to being in in natural environments even if it's just on a green space on a street but it's designed intentionally to create that that impact that impact on individuals but looking at the whole system which includes the people on it right so want to get to uh a little bit more you've mentioned podcasting a little bit um is that connected with your experiential ed pro projects yes experiential ed tell experiential. me a little bit about that okay so uh i've been i i wrote a book uh uh we talked about that earlier with the origin story and um it was a book on what i consider an intermediate to advanced facilitation um of one of my superpowers of facilitation uh, going back to ADD is being able to look at things and come up with metaphors and different language 
and how do you strengthen it and how do you take the goals of the group over to here and so i wrote that book loved it what's the book and how do you get it uh the way you get it is you email me sorry you email me and you say i want a copy of tweak it and um basically uh i will send you a pdf copy of it at this point um it is if you want a hard copy i will give you the website that you can go buy it for the same price i do because it's self-published um but uh i'm at a point where uh that's not what my main money stream or what i want to put my time and effort in and it's silly for that to just sit on my hard drive chris again cavert as a mentor kind of asked me about that and had to think about it for two years but yeah email me and i will send you a pdf copy of the book all I ask is that number one, uh, you have some years under your belt um, in the way of this book is going to make a lot more sense. It is not an activity book. We talked about Carl. Carl wrote awesome activity books and they're still around. So if I'm in the book going to say, hey, this is traffic jam um, and here's how I modify it or tweak it, um, there's a certain expectation that you've run it enough that you've seen what this challenge can do with the group and why to do it. If you don't quite have that, um, I encourage you when you look at the book to go and find these original activities and find another facilitator that can kind of train you in how to do those activities. That's not what this book is. But based on that, I always wanted to do a second book. I am not a writer. Yay, AI, but I'm still not a writer. Um, I'm an idea guy. I'm a talker. And so I came up with this idea that one of the things I wanted to do if I ever wrote another book was a book called Experiences. Um, and what I wanted to know is I have a key moment in my facilitation where I realized I was imitating my mentors. I was trying to be the best facilitator possible by staying within the confines of what I thought I had to be based on those who taught me. And I wanted to use my story of how I found my voice in the way of, yeah, going back to the most important things we ever learned. Uh, yeah, I learned that I ha am, regardless whether I knew it or not, is I can be par passive aggressive. And if I'm not careful with the group, I can do more harm than good. Because my sense of humor, the way that uh, maybe I just grew up with guilt shots in my family culture, that that can come across if I'm not careful. And I've learned to say with a group like, hey, respect anybody here have a sarcastic sense of humor. Yeah, I'll raise my hand first, but that's not going to work today. Well, I have to, I found out early on that um, I was being a jerk and didn't even know it. And it was through that experience I had to go, I'm not Andy McSheffrey. I'm not these other great people that I'm trying to emulate, which helped me remember years later when I met, you know, the guys I was talking about was to be able to ask them for advice, but not be them, right? The danger of being the next Carl Ronke. I want to be Chris Cavert. You know, that that doesn't work in any field. We can have mentors. We can look up to them. I want to be like Mike. I don't want to be Mike, right? I'm sorry, I'm dating myself. I want to be like Michael Jordan and drink Gatorade and wear Hanes underwear. I don't want to, I can't be Michael Jordan, okay? That's unrealistic. And it's not so even- So tell me how this links to- Yes, thank the you. Podcast. So the link to the podcast is after 10 years of sitting on this idea, I went, well, I know why I'm not doing it. I'm not, I'm not a writer, but I could invite people in and ask them to share their story. And that's what experiential ed experiences is. I want to ask people, what was the moment in right now through that professional lens? Originally, I was thinking just facilitators, but I think we all have stories to tell no matter what profession we have of when something happened that you then had to realize, whoa, this is who I am in this field. This is not me emulating. That's not going to work, but this is. And I have now permission because I've had this wake up call to go out and be the best me at what I do possible instead of trying to be the best somebody else doing what I do. And I want to hear those stories because I think that young professionals, as, as we've talked about in our conversations, this could be very helpful to know that if you're not getting it, 
there might be another piece and they don't have to come and listen to my podcast, but maybe somebody is inspired to share their story with somebody at work that's new to the field, right? It's all about, I want the podcast to be this, the center of that ripple effect um, that encourages people to tell their stories with other people so we can all be learning from each other. It goes back to the SEL and the prevention. There's no need for us to all be doing this on our own, yeah. right? I need that support having ADD and having the brain I'm born into as I tell the kids, right? So I've got a friend, uh, Greg McNair Wilson, who is a former Imagineer, just incredibly creative guy. One of his favorite phrases is, if you don't do you, nobody will. And it's a powerful thing. And it sounds like as you've talked about this, so I love exploring origin stories and you love like formation stories of like, where does your passion come from? When, what story can you tell about that? And as you talked about your grant being towards uh, getting artist stories, what I wonder is, might it be, would the, would the grant accept instead of artists where you say, I'm going to get creators story. Because there, I think everybody associates creators with artists. But in the lately, um, well, first of all, everybody's a creator. So you could find the artist in that accountant. Um, and, and frame it that way. So now all of a sudden you're exploring community artists, but it's about that executive and their artist story. Um, so I'm curious about, I mean, would the, would the grant accept that? as as it fits so i'm tempted to pull up on another screen and ask um so here's my understanding and this is why i created the the ai to help me with it is that one of the things that i told the ai to help me with is everything i want to do has to be reflected in the granting bodies number one rules for the grant and their mission and statement and one of the things as I was doing this, and this is why it started evolving, was originally I was trying to do just, I want funding to do this podcast we we're talking about with experiential experiences. But the feedback I got from the AI and you can't take it at face value, I, you know, I've also designed it to give me the resources, what page is this on and looking at it is they want it specifically to number one, advanced art in Chicago, which the creator side could do. But they also want it to um, advance arts in the underserved neighborhoods of the community. And so this is where in lies the rub of yes, and I have a better chance of winning the grant if I go the artist route. Yeah, yeah. I'm but, just trying to think through, like, because I know that you have a broader brush than just traditional arts and i think maybe even interpreting advancing the arts and saying let's expand what we call art yeah and i'm going to be honest with you right now about this is that uh i'm down to a 10 percent chance of actually applying for this grant there's a major hurdle that uh, again um i probably could get around but the more i'm working on this with the art one and knowing that specifically the experiential ed podcast and the other one that I'm thinking about doing about talking to facilitators about different initiatives and, and again, their experiences with it don't fit. This goes back to what I was talking about is I've got to follow my passion. Yeah. And there is a certain pull for me in AI and it's really intriguing me of a podcast to help artists specifically and also having them share their yeah. stories. Right. But yeah, using AI without selling your soul. Yeah, and you know, you and I show that all the time. And I and and, and I had a really good conversation with the AI, and I'm like, oh, this is awesome, this is great, blah blah blah. But you know what? At the end of the day, um, there are a few technicalities that I'm spinning a certain way to just be able to apply for for the grant. Um, because yeah, I can't sit here and say, I mean, I'd love to say that facilitation and Jen Stanchfield, who we both know and has written great books on processing, the art of facilitation. We are artists. That's not what this grant is for. Right, right. I get that. I But again, it's a matter of pushing boundaries and what but the heck, it, turn it in. You no, know, and, and, I, and I am planning on turning it in because it's another thing, but this is what I say about AI. 
is even if you are doing something with AI and it crashes and burns and it is a horrible, like, this is not what I wanted, I walk away from it just like I would ask a group to walk about way about it is, you know, a great question that comes up a lot in our field of facilitation is, um, do you allow a group to fail? Which there could be 30, po- that could be a podcast in and of itself. People have so many, in- but the way I look at it is, yeah, I don't set them up for failure unless that is a specific goal. And then it's very structured as like, this group needs to know how to fail. Um, and I've worked with those groups, but in general, I don't set them up for failure. But when they fail, I'm thrilled because that is an experience that we can process and go through Kolb or whoever you want to say, and we can talk about what do we do now? And I'm trying to do that and I'm loving it because every time I fail with AI, I'm feeling like whether it's true or not, the Edison quote, we all love thrown around at the challenge course of I now know 999 ways not to make a light bulb. I know so many ways not to make a prompt. And that gets me so excited to do the next one. But that's back to that passion of wanting to figure this out to, to help myself and other people with this. Yeah. And that's what I love about how our our the community that we formed over the pandemic virtually and all that. Basically, our premise is um, let's try and break things so that we can break it to our will. And that's a different way of saying that we're going to fail. And we're going to fail because we tried to do too much um, because we took it different directions. But to me, that's a different way. I have part of me is on a little bit of a soapbox of saying, let's reclaim failure as a word and not fear it. Mm -hmm. Um, But and one way to do that is like we just broke something and now we can learn from it. So now before we wrap things up here, I got basically a couple of what I call lightning around questions. Okay. I just want you to go with the first thought that comes in your head. You're not signing a contract. Um, It's just what comes to your head first. Can we put 30 seconds on the clock for me? uh, Yeah, I'll I'll ding. (laughs) Um, So a couple of sentences. Um, What's your favorite book or media to give as a gift? Not including your book, but... Think about it. What's your favorite or what was the last book you gave somebody? Oh, I had a reader. Uh, or I said, or media. Or media. Yeah. I so if it's that, Doctor Who, that's media. No, and I think what it, what it really is, is that because of, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm a Star Wars fan. Okay. It's introducing people. Can't tell. Um, yeah, not at all. Um, introducing people to the Clone Wars and Rebels cartoons. Um, I think there's, again, storytelling. They they are fantastic stories that if you like Star Wars, you're just missing out. And if you like storytelling, you need to be familiar with Star Wars. Okay. So I've asked this question. And in today's day and age, people have a hard time pinning down one of this characteristic. So what I'll say is if you could take the parts of maybe two, three, four different people to assemble your hero. Who is your hero? Okay. If you got one, that's great. But if you need to assemble, that's cool too. Uh, first, first is going to be uh, the 10th doctor from Dr. Who David Tennant's uh, doctor. Uh, and now actually I changed that over to the, whatever he just played the 15th doctor um sorry not not the the fandom i'm most on so there'd be an aspect of that um i would oof i would definitely take uh aspects of my dad um as my first hero and somebody i still look up to um and then i think that uh I'm trying to think because Chewbacca came to mind. And I think that I'm going to go with that is there's, there is a fierce loyalty and kindness that is in that character. Um, and yeah, I just can't get off of star Wars right now. So I'm yeah. going to go. With and that. that's fine. That's fine. I Let me go. to the last. Awesome. Yeah. Um, last one. And again, this could be different medias, but uh, who do you find yourself quoting most often? Who or what? What's your favorite quote? Uh, actually, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, because there are two quotes that I, I came across when I started doing Tweak It as a presentation first book and then presentation again. And uh, 
Oh no, uh, ooh, no, no. So the the first quote is Alice in Wonderland. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Um, which I believe is the Cheshire Cat, which is uh, the basis of my facilitation. There are times when I have nothing, and I'm going to be completely open to whatever is going on. I'm going to do group juggle because I know that one the best, and I'm going to watch the group and see where we're going because I don't know where we're going but I'm ready to go wherever that group takes me. Yeah. And at the same okay. time, flip it around and I have an intention a goal. And yeah, if I don't know where I'm going, anyone, anywhere can get me there. But the other one, I, I just realized it's not Alice in Wonderland and I don't know where it comes from is all roads lead to, to Rome, um, which I'm really sure is not Alice in Wonderland. Um, but the idea again, with what I do with facilitation is that um, once you hone your skills as a facilitator and I use group juggle, um, I can make group juggle meet any goal. And it's the two sides of that coin that I find is that when I don't know what to do, I trust the process because, and also if I'm not going to be intentional, I can't be upset wherever I wind up because if I didn't have an intention, well, right. Here's where I am. Right. Yep. That's where we ended up. Yep. So, well, we're going to wrap things up here and, um, Thank you. Ed. Thank you for your candidness, for your willingness to go different places. And this is wonderful. I, I, I know that we're going to talk, if not weekly, more often. But uh, um, thank you. I look forward to seeing what happens with the podcasts. Everybody look for uh, Ed Kaplan's Experiential Ed Podcasts, uh, looking at the stories and looking at the facilitation, all that kind of stuff. So thanks a lot, Ed. You're welcome and thank you. And I'm, I'm just putting it right out. I want you to be one of my first guests on the podcast. Be present and kind as you do great things.